the Happy Papa Dom restaurant is now open for all your. News. Good evening and welcome to Raconteurs News this lovely Wednesday evening. Um, I, just give us a message in the chat room and let us know you can hear us, Ken or Luby or someone. Um, and while I remember, better say hi to uh, Jason's best mate, Heath, because it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Heath, and happy birthday to anyone else who's got a birthday who's out listening there. And um, well, it's midsummer, isn't it? Grey skies, full of cloud, blowing a gale, hot and well, not even hot, but sticky and muggy. And same with you, Jason. Yeah, there's uh, a few. I'm looking out, and there's quite a few angry clouds sort of coming in over the west. Some low-lying cloud as well, but it's the, the sun's breaking through at, at various points. It's but it is sticky. It's uh, it's it's a rather warm uh, and i seem to live in an area where there's a bell end that's got himself one of them little motorbikes it makes so much noise and it is the smallest honestly when you see him driving past it's like a, it's like a toy yeah and it's making that much noise and he keeps going past and he's doing my head in and uh, i think i might be out there with some some very strong fishing wire in a you know a couple of days and see if we can uh, stop him that way Oh, yeah. yes. Well, we don't advocate okay. violence, of course. But, um, no, 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 no. In a non-violent way. The yeah. uh, the fishing wire is simply just to, to erase his head, non-violently. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, that, I think we'd better move on because uh, we're, all, we're all Brexit excited here. And uh, to be honest, it's a balls and pony show. They're going to do what they want to do, whatever we say, my opinion. Um but uh, we've got our high-level financial insider, Paul, who wasn't able to make the last show because of a, a, a family issue that cropped up at the last minute. But he's back, and he's got loads to tell us. So welcome back, Paul. Good evening, Jan. Good How evening, Paul. Back? Good evening. You both okay? Yeah, we are. I think we are. We had a, a really good show last night. And it's a three-day week this week, so we're a little bit nosebleed and we're doing a, quite a lot more work than we we're used to, but... Yes, uh, we'll do anything to accommodate you, Paul, um, you, well, I'm very, yeah, your very information. Great. Well, if you get a nosebleed, Jason, you'll be all right. Just sleep in your inclined bed and you'll be right in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so uh, what's been happening with you, Paul, and what have you got to tell us? Right, okay, I thought I'd start with something because I, you know, we said back in December that the belief was, you know, obviously the button's being pushed on the cabal. We're in mm-hmm. the kind of home straight, the belief was. It would happen early 2016. Now, of course, it's the 22nd of June and early 2016 being gone. However, it came to pass in the last couple of days where I had a conversation with someone. And it very much transpires that it was supposed to happen in March of this year. So the early 2016 forecast was correct in the sense of when it was supposed to happen, but for some reason it didn't. And it only transpired that I realised this because person concerned had to leave one place to go somewhere else and was earmarked to do that at the end of February, um, beginning of March. And that was the reason why I was aware that, that it should have happened. And now the argument would be, well, OK, why did it not happen? Well, we can speculate a little bit on that. And I use the word speculate. I think it's becoming increasingly apparent that there's more of an emphasis on having a soft landing rather than a hard landing. 
But of course, there is still the risk that we can have a hard landing financially because there's so many plates spinning, which if one falls, 100 will fall, and then we'll have chaos economically. So we're not at the woods, but I think there is a desire to try and avoid a hard landing where I think back at Christmas it was, well, it's a hard landing come what may, and mm -hmm. hence the, the reset's going to happen, or whatever, however you want to phrase that, um, in early 2016. So the forecast was correct in that sense, but there was a delay. Now, I don't know whether that's a delay for because, in fact, you know, we there isn't a mood to, to shift it to a soft landing. It seems to be that way, but there could be a whole bunch of reasons why there was a delay. I mean, you know, without going into too much detail about gold, we thought the gold fix with yuan denominated gold fix might be a catalytic moment. It certainly is in the grand scheme of things, but the Chinese thus far have been reticent to push the button on that, which they could do very easily, and that could cause this you know, financial reset in five minutes, quite literally. So I thought it'd be worth starting and making that point first, just to uh, give people a bit of an update. Obviously, if I can glean any other information that we can share with everybody in the, in the coming weeks and months, then obviously I will do so. But I thought it'd just be worth mentioning that. Mm -hmm. I did. I did. Uh, I did read. What What do you think that is happening in Brazil? Because Brazil seems to be on the end of quite a bit of a kicking from the cabal. They've, they've we've got this Zika virus, which is causing all sorts of problems with the uh, the Olympics. It seems to me that, that Brazil perhaps is, is being punished by the cabal. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, certainly there was a coup to remove Rousseff. And uh, and it's kind of succeeded, but now it's backfired and it's blown up in their face. And there's kind of a lot of governments are being booted out. And there's big investigations. And I think the, the cabal's idea that they were going to rule the Rousseff is blown up in their face. And I remember when it all came out, I said on the Facebook page, watch what happens, it's not going to be straightforward and it, I think it is backfiring on the cabal. And, you know, the idea of the Zika virus, well yes, but do they really want to, to affect the Olympics? The Olympics, you know, is a big cash cow for them, uh, to coin a crude economic term. I can't see them deciding to, to you know, cause the Olympics just to to evaporate into thin air and not happen. Rather like people were saying, oh there's going to be all this terrorism and the Euro 2016 football tournament, well, I don't want to tempt fate, but thus far there's been no evidence of, of any of that happening, and I don't think it will either. They're very, I don't think they're quite reticent to start causing all sorts of huge um, catalytic events that may cause major problems for them at these, at these kind of sporting occasions, but never rule anything out, but I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But in terms of Brazil, yeah, there was a clear, clear they wanted to wrestle Brazil out the bricks, um, and they saw it as the weakest link, obviously, compared to Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and yeah, they most certainly tried that, but I think it's already backfiring on them quite badly, and I suspect, in the fullness of time, it will completely blow up in their face, um, as we've seen in what's happened in Syria, and what's happened in Ukraine, what's all starting to happen in Libya, where the various sort of factions within Libya itself has realised, no, let's stop fighting each other, this is ridiculous, let's fight the real enemy, and they're starting to go for for ISIS or whatever they're called in Libya, because it's very hard to keep up with all the various names of them. So, we're seeing that sort of backlash and certainly that's happened in Brazil. Yeah, I, I, with, with you saying that, um, obviously the, the Olympics is a huge cash cow um, and they probably might be a little bit reluctant to um, to disrupt that in a major way, but I would have thought that the exclusion of Russia would have sort of made that more. Um, do you think? Do you think that they might be setting up for the Olympics to happen, and then perhaps something to happen during the the Olympics, and for that to be blamed on Russia? Because certainly we've seen. Um, with the Euro 2016, there's been a lot of violence in different places, and, and, and there's been violence throughout France in, in uh, lots of social unrest, but that's not been reported on. But we've had this problem with the Russian fans and the Brit the English fans, um, which in this country has been spun mostly for the Russians. Do you think there's there's any sort of legs in, in, in thinking that, that, that they might try something and blame it on Russia? 
They could try it, but it would be so ridiculous. I mean, who's is anyone seriously going to imagine that Russia would try something in in Brazil, which it has ties with through through the BRICS and various other uh, you know alliance and strategic kind of financial arrangements? And uh, no, I mean, yeah, they arguably they could try anything, but no. I think the point of excluding Russia was just to make a point to the world. You know, Russia's the bad guy still. Don't forget because. Everyone's kind of forgotten that Russia was supposed to be the bad guy in Ukraine because they don't believe it anymore. And, oh, hang on, they've been dealing with this you know, terrorist threat that, by the way, we caused. But they've dealt with it in Syria and the world starts to go, hang on, this doesn't really fit the narrative that you know, Putin's the bad guy and, and Russia are the, the sworn enemy. So, oh, let's just make an example of them over this doping scandal and we'll just boot them out of um, the Olympics and never all think, oh, we're just giving Russia a bloody nose and oh, it looks all very good. And it's all just you know, spineless rhetoric, really. And yeah, they can do whatever they want in that respect. I think Russia, frankly, cares. I mean, they don't seem to be making much of a fuss about it. Um, I mean, they've even they can gone to the extent of going, well, if you athletes can satisfy certain criteria, you can appear as individuals. How does that work? I mean, so they're just doing everything they can to discredit the Russian administration and and the nation and Putin, but it won't work. But no, I, I don't think they'll try and pull anything at, uh, at the Olympics. I mean, we know back in the seventies, for people with long memories at Munich, there was that big shooting and killing in, in nineteen. I think it was seventy two. Seventy two, we would think it were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there, and who knows what the the reality of it was then in terms of who was responsible and why, but. I mean, yeah, you can't necessarily rule out, and I don't kind of like to have faith with these things, but I, I doubt anything will happen at the Olympics. But, you know, by then, we're talking a couple of months' time, the desperation may get worse. I mean, we've seen some events recently um, where the cabal are desperate, but their ability to do things is very much muted, and I'm not going to in any way, shape, or form trying to trivialise the death of one person. One person is one too many, but in the grand scheme of what they would have been capable of in the past, they're, they're not able to do the, the massive atrocities which they were capable of doing previously. And So, yeah, as I've said, they've lost the war, but there's still some battles, and we're seeing these battles happening from time to time. And whilst you can't say for certainty, let's hope that, in fact, Brazil doesn't, or the Olympics doesn't uh, de- degenerate into such an event. Well, yeah. Yeah, just taking that little sidestep, Paul, I, I was having a conversation with someone, I think it was very early last week, and uh, it's a person that I won't name because uh, the conversation was private, but no, uh, no, it's someone, no, don't, don't someone very not. well known in this movement that we like to call truth, and um, their opening remark to me was, when's the false flag going to be then? And I said, well, I've been expecting something, particularly leading up to this Brexit. And then a couple of days later, we have this um, the reports of uh, Joe Cox being murdered. And uh, like you say, any, any loss of life is tragic. But um, very soon after that happened, uh, it seems to be some quite strange anomalies in the reporting, not least of which... Um, just popped up today on a, a kind of well known for not being terribly reliable website called Veterans Today, and they've published a link to the obituary of the 77 year old man that was supposed to have helped her and got stabbed, and apparently he died in 2013. So, <laughs> um, I've, I've looked at the links. It looks like it could be the same guy, but there's no picture, so there's no way really of checking that one out. Um, you know, is it... Well, veterans today, I think Gordon Duff himself said that 40% of what they publish is absolute drivel, didn't it? Yeah, well, I think uh, with all this Brexit, I always like to take a, a bit of a back seat for a, for a day or so and say, OK... Let's follow a sort of crude chronology of what's gone on the last few weeks. We've certainly seen evidence in the UK of a big sort of swing in a few days before Joe Cox was murdered were towards the Leave campaign. And there was a, seemed to be they were starting to pull away. 
not massively, but there was a bit of a, quite a bit of a swing, maybe sort of the one or two percent, maybe five, six, seven, eight percent. I mean, okay, polls are polls, and you have to take them with a liberal dose of salt. But anyway, that was what was coming out. We saw, you know, I was watching the markets because the pound was getting hammered against the dollar. The markets were tumbling. Gold was getting got to thirteen hundred again, mm. and there is some argument, we'll talk a bit about gold later on, but in fact it wasn't necessarily completely linked to Brexit, and I do agree with that. But And then, of course, we had Joe Cox's death, and I then go, okay, what what's going to happen? What's the reaction to this? And should there be a reaction? Of course, immediately. We saw the, the markets go through the roof. They were, they were you know, they, I think, the futures on Sunday evening, when they opened at 11 p.m. UK time, you know, the DAX was at 250 points, and I'm asking myself, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And we saw this huge drive in in the DAX, the Dow, the Pulse. We saw the pound go from one dollar forty to today it got nearly to one forty eight. So, the same, and then suddenly all the polls were shifting, going, oh well, it looks like uh, Brexit's not going to happen. We're going to remain in the EU. And there's all this rhetoric coming out of the media. And I immediately asked myself, hang on a minute, why is this happening? Why would somebody being killed, as tragic as it is, and whatever the reasoning for whoever did it, did it, and we don't really, it's not really clear, I mean, whether it's saying, well, what's this? people are talking this politically motivated, but you know, frankly, I'm not really interested in the whys and wherefores of that. Well, that's just bollocks, isn't it? That's just people yeah. use it. For, I mean, no matter what you think about what happened to Joe, um, Joe Cox. Um, it, 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 anybody speculating that it's politically motivated, uh, and, and what about the timing as well? It, it comes in pretty much the same time as the uh, it, who was the Swedish? Um, well, yeah, I was just going to get on to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so I watched all this financial point. stuff, and I went, well, hang on, this doesn't make any sense. Why would this spark a rally in the markets? I mean, okay, the timing might have been a massive coincidence. But there didn't seem to be any other reason for it. And then, when I posted the link up um, on the Facebook page back in September 22, sorry, 2003, Anna Lind was was a really popular Swedish politician, and at one time was tipped as a likely successor to the then Prime Minister. And she had a reputation; she was, you know, deemed as competent, very consistent, and so she was good at negotiating skills. She was a vehement pro-European. And she was at the heart of the government's campaign to try and win over us, you know, us kind of sceptical public to join, to having European membership and adopting the single currency. Now, there are some strange, you know, parallels and similarities in that she was obviously murdered. Actually, ironically, of course, Sweden didn't vote in the single currency and to this day still retains the krona. But, you know, I think even, I think it was CNBC when, hang on, there's some strange... Uh, you know, parallels and similarities between the timing, give or take a day or two, and uh, this happening then, you know, back in 2003, and obviously what's happened in 2016 with Joe Cox. So that kind of raised some slight eyebrows from my perspective as to more similarities. Um, but it it just seemed an incredible coincidence that this event happened, and then we suddenly saw this this huge surge in the markets and this confidence that Brexit wasn't going to happen and the pound suddenly went you know up basically eight you know eight cents to, against the dollar in a matter of days is is quite some move where it's down to 140 and and they're all saying oh it's because of Brexit and gold went to 13 oh it's because of Brexit well tell me what's changed in terms of Brexit nothing you know polls are polls and it, it doesn't mean an awful lot, but all of a sudden the rhetoric's changed and the idea now that they're pushing is, oh, well, Britain's uh, going to stay, remain, and okay, it may happen. And we can certainly speculate that the, the risk of rigging in terms of the vote, I, I do think that's a serious risk. And But I think if, the, if it was a kind of 55, 45 in favour of leave or greater, they wouldn't be able to rig it. They really, they can rig it on small margins. But I don't think they could rig it on a on a bigger margin. So, but you know, we might be talking one or two percent either way. So that is always a risk and a problem. But then we come to this argument that says, well, 
there's a school of thought that says, well, the cabal would love to have Brexit right now because it would give them an excuse for the markets to implode. And, but that's the, that's the belief that the cabal are in, in control. The cabal are desperately trying to stop Brexit happening because they don't really care if Britain leaves the European Union because it really doesn't matter. I mean, despite all the rhetoric of what is going to cause economic implosion, well, it's not because the, the pound will drop against uh, the euro. So for us to trade in Europe from an export perspective, it needs to be very competitive. And I think I read Britain's responsible, in, you know, indirectly through trade for about 6 million, 7 million jobs in the European Union. Well, the European Union is not going to go, well, let's, let's just lose all those jobs. Absolutely not. So the economic statement that it's going to be catastrophic is nonsense. So there's no economic reason for it. So, but from the cabal's perspective, the frightening part is Britain leaves. We know certainly Germany, France, Holland, Austria, to name four nations, have had enough of the European Union. They want out. Now, what's likely to happen if Britain says, we want out? I can see other nations like France, particularly, will immediately say, we want a referendum. Holland will want a referendum. Germany will want a referendum. And a couple of few nations like that do it. The European Union's death very. And I think we have to go back and have our little history lesson with what the European Union was all about. And we have to go back, right back to the 30s when Hitler was bankrolled into power mm. by an American bank of which Prescott Bush, who's Daddy Bush's father, was, was one of the, you know, the, the shareholders' chief protagonists in that bank. They bankrolled Hitler prior to the war, so they rebuilt Germany, they built the German war machine. Eventually, they were shut down in '42, which is probably why Germany lost the war. But there may be other reasons, such as you know, going into to Russia, which ironically is apparently the 75th anniversary of that today. But anyway, that's a side point. So we go back to that point. Of course, we know what happened in history. The Nazis lost the war. They didn't do what they wanted to do, which was to effectively colonise Europe, control it, undoubtedly eventually with a single currency, and we go, but you know, we they went more bad to uh, to the US. The Nazis who survived, that's you know, that's proof. We know that happened. They were they camped there and went, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to go back into Europe and control it now? Well, we'll call it the European Common Market because people will buy that. It sounds great. We'll all trade and be really friendly together. Of course, they gradually over years stripped the edifice away. Now, apart from military stomping all over European nations. The European Union is exactly what the Nazis wanted to achieve. And who actually is responsible for the modern-day European Union? The Bush family. That's, people say, oh, it's a CIA operation. We've seen a lot of that kind of rhetoric coming out in, in the alternative uh, community now in terms of people making these comments. I read something the other day, which I posted on the Facebook page. It was quite a, a large sort of um, treatise of what was going on in Europe and what it's all about. And it does mention but ultimately, it's a Bush construct. Now, there's your, there's your parallel and there's your similarity straight on. So, that's exactly what it is. So, Merkel is, is a puppet of Washington. They're all puppets to do as they're told because Washington wants to control Europe. Why does it want to control Europe? Well, because if it doesn't control Europe, all these European nations, and we'll talk about the St. Petersburg Forum in a little bit because but I won't go into too much detail, but Europe would quite happily move towards its natural trading partner, Russia. And what's the one thing the cabal are terrified of? We've said this many times. It's that, it's that Berlin, Moscow, Beijing, and now Tehran access. They're terrified of that. Because if they lose control of Europe, they'll lose control of their ability to try and influence Russia, which is what Ukraine is all about, to try and destroy Russia internally, as well and failing that to try and start World War Three, which, of course, has failed as well. So these, this is what you know, the European Union is all about. And we never hear people discuss this, and it degenerates into these farcical arguments about the economy. And even worse is this whole thing about immigration, where now it's, well, if you want to leave the European Union, you know, you, you must be racist and right wing. And this is absolutely farcical. I've got no issue with anybody living in any nation. If people want to come to the UK, we can accommodate them, fine. That's, that, 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 there's no problem with that. But it's being turned into a political weapon mm -hmm. to now justify it in the eyes of people, oh, well, 
you know, it's a right wing if you want to leave. Well, if you want to apply that stupid analogy, the left wing are all for, for Brexit. Well, so the left wing like to live in a dictatorial European super state, and they don't seem to realise that's what the European Union is about. So they're calling people fascist and uh, and racist for wanting to leave. Well, actually, they don't realise that the European super state is, is like a fascist dictatorship anyway, or what it wants to be. So there's absolutely no difference in their argument. But they just fail to see what the European Union is about. Mm-hmm. They just focus on this ideology, oh, it's great for everybody, and Without it, we can't trade. Well, just ask Norway. Norway never joined. They don't seem to have any problems. Switzerland never joined. They don't have any problems. It's a myth and an illusion just to you know, distract people from the reality of what's going on. Uh-huh. And it's something else that I think is, is worth noting about the in or out of Europe. Um, in this country, we supposedly... Uh, are governed under common law, though it often doesn't seem like it, and you're innocent until proven guilty. Now, mm-hmm. uh, over in mainland Europe, they're under Napoleonic law, and uh, it, as it, where it's here, you're allowed to do whatever you like so long as it's not forbidden by law. Over there, you're only allowed to do what the government tells you, and um, you are presumed guilty. And you have to prove your innocence. So that that's a big difference if you want to be part of that. Mm, don't think I'd really enjoy that myself. But then, no, like you're right. But so someone said to me, if Britain um, stays in the European Union, it can kiss goodbye to, as you say, notionally common law. I know I'm not I'm not that great on the whole aspect of, but it's obviously more maritime law than common law. But you're right, mm-hmm. you are innocent until proven guilty. And yeah, that's one of the arguments that, that has merit. And, and I always use this point when people talk about, oh, it's economically damaging. I mean, for nations to stop trading with the UK will be economically damaging to them. It's not a one-way street. It's always this idea that the UK suffers if it leaves. The reason I want the world personally and uh, I want the UK to, to get out of the European Union because I want to see an end to the European Union because I want to see nations be autonomous to work together for, for what's beneficial to both both nations and groups of nations. And democracy as it should be, because democracy doesn't exist, certainly not the European Union. For that to exist, that's why I want to an end to it. But And that's the only reason. There's no other reason for it. It's not some ideological thing. I'm not greatest patriot about the United Kingdom. I'm not some nationalistic person. I'm kind of not really that interested in that. I think it's all very ridiculous to be very pro-nationalistic about anything, particularly the way nations are now. And But it's about nations having the autonomy and being able to do what's right for their people rather than being dictated to by, and it is, faceless bureaucrats mm-hmm. who were never elected. I mean, people say, oh, well, these MEPs are elected, but they have no power, no sir. No. Well, from listening to what you said, um, it's quite clear to me the the way you think we should go. Um, But Dr. Rock wants to pin you down a little bit further. He says, does Paul think we'll stay or go? And will it be an honest count? (laughs) Well, will it be an honest count? I think if it's very close, then the risk is they'll rig the vote. Now, Will they rig it to, to yeah, more likely, obviously, to, to, for us to stay in the European Union? Uh, I, I don't doubt that. The argument is, well, and I, I said this kind of recently, um, if it's big enough for ma- the majority to leave, and they can't really rig it, because, I mean, you can rig it on small margin, but if you start rigging it on a massive scale, someone's going to blow, blow the whole thing wide open and say, well, you know, it's being rigged, and they won't be able to hide it. Um, Britain leaves, then gets the mandate and says we want to leave the European Union. I suspect very, very quickly they'll bring all these economic statistics into play that will say we can't do this, we will be massive unemployment in the UK, and we respect your right to vote on this, but for economic reasons we can't do this. Now, that's a very risky thing to do because I think that would be a wake-up call for the, for the people of the UK who would say, hang on you gave us a referendum. We said we, you know, we voted the way we wanted, and you completely ignored us. 
But I think if they're that desperate, but then it comes back to this point, and we know the European Union is certainly a Bush neocon construct. And there's an argument that rightly says, well, the UK cabal are not really in line with the with the US at all. We know that for certain. I mean, Britain's been cozying up to the Chinese for a while now and wanting to work with them for trade and currency swaps and continues to try develop a relationship, joins the AIB, etc., etc. So there's clearly a break between, for, for want of a better word, the US cabal and the UK cabal. I think the UK cabal's pretty much rolling over and has had enough and doesn't want to play ball anymore. I think it's probably largely really the US neocon cabal who want to keep this insanity going. So there might be an argument that says, well, and I've heard, we've heard the UK cabal going, well, it's bad for the UK to leave the European Union. Well, that's words and rhetoric. They may be just saying that but privately they may want to see an end to it because, I mean, after all, the UK cabal fudged their way in the ERM scandal to make sure we didn't have to adopt the euro, the euro as a currency. So they're not, whilst they're part of the European Union, they pretend to be in some sense. They never read the full throttle, as we know, because the UK cabal didn't really want to be part of it because they knew they'd then be under the edict of control of the US cabal, who obviously controlled the European Union. When, when, so, was, when was the ERM? That, weren't that in sort of like 1991? 92, I think it was. 92, yeah. It, it, it just, it just, I'm or just thinking... Or 91, I can't remember the exact year. You're right, but it's ballpark that area. The, but I was just thinking that at that time, they perhaps weren't as organised as they are now. I mean, we, we know now that there's, there's um, lots of evidence of electoral fraud, and, and uh, particularly with the Scottish referendum and the last general election as well. So. Oh, yeah. But back then, that was just really the Britain failed from an economic perspective. It wasn't to do with any referendum. They just economically didn't meet the criteria. But the right. belief was they deliberately failed to meet the criteria so they could go, oh, sorry, we can't join the euro. And it was a very inconvenient way for, for the UK cabal. To I seem to remember that. back in those days as well, there was a, a, a word going around, particularly in the Conservative Party, who were um, in power at the time, um, the, the, the particular word we, they were a lot of Euro skeptics. Um, they don't seem to be as many these days. Oh yeah, there was huge. I mean, they, they were largely Euro skeptic. Um, I mean, we know obviously going back before Major's times, uh, Thatcher was very Euro skeptic, as everybody knows. So yeah, I mean, less so now. I mean, okay, they've got this kind of thing with Boris Johnson on the one side, and there's Michael Gove, and then obviously you've got Cameron on the flip side, and people are going, well, it's all theatre. Well. Yes and no. I'm, I'm, some of the rhetoric that's coming out suggests it's a bit more than theatre, but I don't know. It's difficult to know where, where does the UK fall that's really kind of weakened and is not really wanting to play ball on the cent on the world stage as the way it did. Where does it fit into this? What does it really want? Does it is it trying to come across as all pro? We remain in the European Union, but is it privately hoping let's let's think you know, we're going to leave and and uh, because it will undoubtedly, for me, it will be the catalytic event to, to take down the European Union because it, it'll be like a kind of colour revolution for the European Union, for want of a, a better word. Other nations will say, we've had enough, that we're sick of this. Because despite all the rhetoric, I know for a fact from Holland's perspective, the people there are sick of it. They're sick and tired of the European Union. Heard enough coming out of France, the same way Germany, Austria or most certainly in the rhetoric that came out of her recently regarding their, their you know, commander-in-chief or whatever the equivalent is in the, the Austrian military saying, we're not going to be dictated to anymore. If we want to work with Russia militarily, we will do. Mm -hmm. there, there is big cracks appearing in that relationship. And certainly we know from Germany's perspective, they've had enough. Of their, their industries had enough, the commerce, the legal aspects of the nation are sick and tired of it as well and it grows grows this reluctance to, to conform because I think people are now starting to realise well what's going on with the European Union I mean here's the US dictating telling the European uh, nations you must enforce sanctions and the European nations have got this thing coming up in a couple of days where they're going to review sanctions and they're under enormous pressure to from the US to go you'll keep the sanctions going you won't be even though the sanctions are farcical because they're only hurting 
the European Union and not hurting Russia at all. I mean, they said there was this idea, well, the Russian economy dipped a little bit last year. Yeah, it was because of the oil price. Well, that, that was the only reason. It had nothing to do with sanctions. And then I found out the other day, is the US telling the rest of the European Union, you know, you must adopt these sanctions and, and bullying them into it? Well, it itself, it keeps trading with Russia and signing all these trade agreements in defiance of the sanctions that demand of the European Union. No surprise, but it's just laughable. And this is why I think these European nations are starting to go, hang on a minute, who really is controlling us? Who are these? Who's these faceless entities that really control the European Union? And it's no one in Europe, that's for sure. It is definitely a US cabal edict to control the European Union for all the reasons, well, for some of the reasons we've discussed earlier, but there's there's many, many more, which, you know, you could spend three hours talking about, mm. you know, in it, just in itself. Uh, yeah, we, we've got a, a, a quite an amusing but mm, nail on the head type comment from Dr. Rock in the chat room there. And he says, uh, Boaty McBoatface all over again, or like Island on Lisbon. We can keep on voting, you know. It's your t- own time you're wasting. I've got all day. And he also adds that apparently in Europe, votes are simply regarded as non-binding recommendations. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, well, we saw in Ireland the Lisbon Treaty, how it's basically, oh, well, you voted to reject it. Well, you have to vote again mm. until you don't reject it. So, yeah, but, I mean, we know it's pretty farcical. But I think in the UK, if if they can't rig the vote because they, you know, and you know, don't be surprised even on the flip side that when when the vote comes out, it's sixty percent in favour of remaining, forty percent want to leave. And this won't surprise me at all. It won't be because they've rigged it. It's just that when push comes to pull, people will be gripped by this fear. Oh, if we don't stay part of the European Union, we're going to become this isolated island, and no one will want to trade with us or work with us. And that fear aspect will grip people. Because they'd be, you know, they're buying into the, the fear and the lies about economically what it's going to do to, to the UK. So that is a possibility. But yeah, for sure, we know that, uh, you know, if people don't agree in Europe, they'll just keep making them vote until they do agree. But I think if they try that in the UK, they, they, there might be more resistance than they actually realise. Mm-hmm. And of course, we, 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 we're in this country, we've um, got a. Uh, a mainstream media which are desperate for us to stay in they're desperate for the for the status quo to continue um i noticed what? i was listening to um this this morning when i was on my way to work uh, i listened to um uh, five dead uh, <laughs> bbc radio five dead um uh, and they were reporting that the um the markets were bouncing back in fact i i think i heard it on talk sport there's a guy on there called hank potts who goes on on talk sport yeah yeah, yeah. And he was talking about um, how the the markets had rebounded and bounced back because there that there was this feeling that we were going to remain, and so, so so it's propaganda all around. I mean, how does a how does a normal person uh, how is a normal person able to to uh, to differentiate the rhetoric from 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 what's really going on, and why would us stay in? You know, why would that increase the markets? I, I don't quite understand, understand. Well, the idea is that if the UK leaves, it, it's going to cause all this catastrophic economic implosion and the markets were reacting to this nervously. And um, and that that's the basis of it, which probably they would react if it, whether it was, you know, some propaganda or preconceived idea was going to happen. The markets would certainly react. If we vote to leave, the markets will implode. Um just because people believe in this sanctity of this this beast called the European Union, which we know is not farcical. But what's interesting in terms of the mainstream media, they, apart from the Sun newspaper coming out, the Daily Mail, but actually the Telegraph has come out and said, you know, we, we support leave. You know, we, we, we want out. We don't want to be part of the European Union, which, given it um, has had a kind of a long-term belief that it's been quite Eurosceptic. But um, I, I kind of get the feeling that um, there's a little bit more behind that in terms of the why they've said it and when they've said it. And it might be this idea of, well, what does the, the establishment 
really, really want to happen here? And um, do they want it as an excuse to, to, to get out and break away from the European Union rather than just say, we're leaving? Because, I mean, they promised for years to have a referendum in the UK. We know from 2010, we'll give you a referendum. And they could have just fudged it and never bothered. So they potentially have taken a big risk in, in giving that referendum, particularly if there was a huge swing to leave. But mm-hmm. they'd have a hard job then being able to rig it because you can't do it with sizable margins. And, you know, 5 or 10% you know, swing, you can't, you just cannot rig that because... It would have to be done on such a huge scale. Someone's going to go, hang on. We're seeing you know, that definitely there's some tap, excuse me, tampering with the voting system. Uh, yeah, we, on the, as we're probably drawing to the end of the kind of Brexit uh, talk, um, we've got a, a very incisive question from Susie Q. And mm-hmm. she says, Paul, I'd li- I think ultimately... The UK bankers recognise there is more money to be made by cozying up to China, but the big question is, how infested with the cabal is China? How stable is China really? And are the Dragon family having to fight the cabal in the Chinese government? Well, we know historically China was, rather like Russia, was was heavily infiltrated by Western cabal. Um, that is not the case. I know people are going to argue with me and say, I keep getting it, Putin's cabal, Chinese cabal, everyone's cabal, there's no, there's no good guys in the world, they're all just cabal fighting, you know, the, the Western cabal are, are trying to fight to keep, keep it, and the Eastern cabal want to take control, well this is just not the case, if anyone knows the history, they know damn well that the last thing China and Russia want is a cabal running their nations, and also, you know, they don't want to dominate any other nation, and they don't want to dominate and dictate to each other. So that you know that is most certainly not the case in terms of uh, the way the way things are panning out. From uh, in terms of China, yeah, of course the British recognise China's China's future, but it's not entirely China. China, the ones who put themselves out there on to, to get all the flack, the real Renaissance nation is going to be Russia, and that may surprise people, but that is what is going to happen. And, yeah, China will have huge financial influence but Russia will be very much the nation and will be the Renaissance nation and will, is building all these relationships up more, even more so than China. But yeah, British financial system knows the European Union is gone, whether it via Brexit or just implodes in terms of nations or implodes in terms of the financial system at the bank. It knows it's game over. So yeah, it's been cozying up to China for a while and yeah, it sees the future of looking east, but China's not going to fall for it because they've never forgiven the UK for the opium wars. And rather like Russia's never forgiven um, the Rothschilds for their meddling in terms of um, the Russian Revolution, the overthrow of the Tsars, which they were absolutely responsible for. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they'll play ball and they'll they'll be very polite. But, you know, they're not going to roll over and, and scum them. So, no, there isn't these factions. Now, we keep hearing there's Chinese factions fighting. There is, no, there, are, there is no factions in these countries. They've had enough. They want the end of the cabal. And we're seeing evidence of that all the time. They are doing exactly what US and Germany didn't do. And they're not trying to impose themselves. And people go, oh, the Chinese are taking over the US. Well, they're not taking over the US. In the end, one day, the US will be quite grateful China has done what it's done because it's propping up the US economy, which is very, very weak. I mean, we've talked about this before. And I, I still have a fear that the rest of the world will shake off the cabal and the US will still have these neocon lunatics running amok in their nation. I mean, you only have to look at the US presidential elections, and we've talked about this before. I mean, it's not an issue. I'm not a fan of any, any elections as they are now, but you've got, I said a few months ago, Trump would end up being uh, the Republican ca- presidential candidate. He has been. I've said, from what I understand, he's likely to be the next U.S. president, provided they don't kill him first. But you know, on the flip side, you've got Hillary Clinton. Now, seriously, in any other nation in the world, how could you possibly have Hillary Clinton as a presidential candidate? We don't need to go into all the detail about what she's been involved with in the past and the present. I mean, it's absolutely farcical that you can have that situation. So I am concerned about the U.S. and 
and its future. And certainly, we keep seeing all the economic statistics, which proves that that the Obama administration is the one peddling the fiction. I mean, Yellen came out today and said, you know, our labour force situation is looking very promising. My opinion are really? So you've got 100 million economically inactive people and all the other statistics which we've produced and shown on the Facebook page which show the US is heading into the abyss. It is a dire economic situation. So you know, there is, there's that side to the equation that is rather concerning. But yeah, I, I do think that from the UK perspective, they will cozy up to China. In the end, they will do it with Russia and realise they're going to have to rotate east. And in, in the process, and it's something we can talk about the St. Petersburg Forum, we're seeing the gradual isolation more and more of the US. And the US is hell-bent on isolating itself, but in the process, the rest of the world is paying them lip service whilst actually isolating them. And that that is a big concern from, from the US perspective. Has, has there been, I know traditionally Russia and China um, over the over the centuries have, have been enemies and, and not really got on very well. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, with the, the, the BRICS nations, do you think that the cabal uh, have been doing any sort of shit stirring amongst them and to try to make division amongst the BRICS nations? Well, they try to infiltrate all the time. They're always probing. I mean, you know, Russia still has NGOs. Western ones, China does, but they're kind of watching them, they're under control, and they've shut a lot of them down. They've kind of neutralised a lot of that problem. But yeah, of course, they they tried to infiltrate India when Modi took over. They've been instrumental in this coup that happened in Brazil, even though the people don't want it, and that's already backfiring them. So yeah, they're always probing to try and weaken the, the result. They did it with Russia, obviously, over Ukraine. They thought that would be the, the end of Russia one way or the other. Of course, it failed completely because, of course, you know, if you want to play those stupid kind of games with, with Putin, then you're going to end up coming up short. But, no, I mean, Russia and China are joined at the hip. They, they very much see the world the same way. They want the same things, and, and they're going to move towards it. And, of course, the only way, as I see it, if you want to discredit them, you're just going to have to try and convince the people in the world well, they're as bad as, as we are. You know? They're not good guys. They're just going to run a mock and control the rest of the world. Well, and if you think they could bowl, well, fine. But it answers me one question. What, why did Russia go in to Syria and deal with the ISIS, Daesh, whatever else, Al-Qaeda, from where the Westerns, we know, didn't do it because they were funding training and arming them, etc., etc. And people say, oh, it's because of the gas pipelines. No, no. They did it because they realised that if the cabal overthrows Assad, then the Middle East will collapse. And the cabal's plan for the Middle East will come into fruition. And that's the big linchpin for them. Yeah, everything was about the Middle East, certainly from the neocon perspective, perhaps less from, from the kind of Rothschild perspective. But also, to some extent, yeah, of course, it does influence the Rothschild. They destroyed that, that the capability and rendered the whole cabal's initiative in the Middle East inert. And they didn't do that because they're cabal. Quite the contrary, they did it because they realised the threat it posed to the, to the wider world. Uh -huh. And just to clarify there, Paul, when you talk about the cabal's plans for the Middle East, are you talking about the Oded Yainon plan or the plan for greater Israel? Yeah, well, all those things, they, you know, the plan was, you know, to certainly extend the borders of Israel, they wanted to partition Iraq and really just break up the Middle East and, and in a way that they could control it better. And of course, it's not just about, it's ultimately about resources. And yeah, they want all the gas and oil that Syria's got because, you know, as ever, the whole purpose of the cabal is death, destruction, grand larceny. So you either do as you're told, if you don't, we'll kill you all, wreck your nation, and then get our cronies to come and rebuild it at great expense to you as a nation and in the process we'll steal all your assets as well I mean, and you know not being rude but that's exactly what the Nazis did mm. there's no difference that's precisely how they stomped all over anybody who got in their way and there's no difference and that's why the parallels between what went on in World War II and the European Union the same there's no difference and you know we've seen interesting elite coming out if you want to further take this about the European Union the European Union Apparently, in a week's time, it's going to start opening talks with Turkey about sessions of the European Union, whatever. Now, here's a nation 
but nobody can deny they're involved with ISIS, ISIL, whatever they're called, in terms of buying oil, trading arms. They're definitely, you know, siding with terrorism. And the European Union just goes, well, hang on, that's perfectly okay. You know, you, we don't mind you've done all that. Well, that's a US edict because the US, the you know, cabal are the ones who want to enforce all this insanity in the Middle East. They're the ones who are allowing the nations like Turkey to do what they do. So this goes again to prove the fact the US cabal are dictating and telling the European Union, you must allow talks with, with Turkey to happen. And you must allow Turkey to eventually join the European Union. Why do they want to do that? Because it expands them. You know, the territory and also because strategically, as we know, Turkey is an important nation geographically because it kind of is between Europe and Asia, but also obviously particularly the Middle East, given that it borders with Syria, etc. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in regards to the trade in oil with ISIL, or ISIS, Daesh, whatever you want to call them, um, I remember CIA. not long back, uh, we had Gordon Bowden on, um, and he was talking mainly about the, the boiler rooms at Finchley Road and and how this sort of practice is starting to be investigated in Australia and in France now, and they're, they're using some of his evidence. He'd even taken some of his evidence and presented it at the Russian embassy just before he spoke to us. Um, but he did... Uh, say that he'd got uh, documentary evidence of several very high-profile figures in this country, and if memory serves me well, they're MPs, and they're actually uh, involved with companies that are dealing oil with ISIS as well. Oh, I don't doubt it, I think. you know, I mean, I'm not to let the, as much as I say the US is dictating to the European, and I'm not trying to blame the US cabal for everything, you know, the UK is up to its neck in everything, as we know. And yeah, for sure, there's no doubt where there's money to be made, you're going to get massive corruption in any nation. And certainly it will involve the UK and other European nations. There's, there's no doubt about that. But, you know, Russia knows everything that the West is doing, and it can use it for leverage. It knows, it's got all the intelligence. It, it has you know, all the best hackers in the world. You can just walk into anywhere and get any information they want, and they'll sit on it until the appointed time. They've got all the, the information on Clinton, every last bit of it. They know they have all the intelligence that the, the West has been sharing with each other for the last, well, who knows, decade. They have everything. But they'll just sit on it, because unlike the Western cabal, who will immediately gung-ho act with something and use it you know, as aggressively as possible, Russia see the, the controlling aspect is to say very little and use it as leverage to be able to get the West to back out of the situation, which they've done very successfully, apart from the fact that militarily they're light years ahead of the West, and the West realises that. So that's why I keep hearing all this nonsense about World War Three. It'll never happen, because Russia's basically said, well, if you want to do that, we'll incinerate your nations in five minutes flat. And they've now got aircraft that no missile defence system in the West can even see, never mind attack. So they could quite easily just steamroll or any nation or groups of nations and come out with maybe a scratch on their knee. Well, Cabal aren't going to risk that, and that's why they've backed out of Syria, they've backed out of Ukraine, and they're in no, they've got no desire to start waging war with, with the Russians because they know they'll lose. They, they essentially, the pussies. That's what that's what they are, aren't they? They they are pussies. They they they, well, they 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 try to manipulate the way through everything. But when it comes down to it, if it, if it came to like gloves off, who who are you who are you backing? Are you backing Putin or are you backing Cameron if they've got the tops off? <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and they're going to start having a, a, a bit of a a bit of a Queensbury rules. Well, yeah, it's not going to happen, but of course, that's what, bull, you know, ultimately, in a crude sense, that's exactly what bullies do. They stomp around the world threatening everyone, but as soon as someone stands up to the bully, the bully caves in very rapidly, and we've, you know, we've all experienced and seen that during our school days, you always had the, the class bully or the, the bullies in the school who tried to go around intimidating people, and as soon as one person stood up to them, they caved in, and that was the end, so, you know, in a very crude sense, and that like, well, underestimates the severity of the problem we have across the globe with the cabal, but ultimately, in a very crude sense, they are just bullies. And, uh, 
and we've seen in recent years nations are now starting to say we're not going to tolerate this. And, and in terms of you know something we'll cover with over the St. Petersburg Forum, um, we can talk a bit more about the whole sanctions thing and the reality of what's going on in European nations. And they're now starting to pay lip service to, to the US and say, oh yes, we're doing all this. And then privately they're doing exactly the opposite because they know it's not in their interest to destroy their own nations. And you know, Germany's a great example. It was destroyed after World War I. The Treaty of Versailles was deliberately put into place to destroy them completely so they'd end up with World War II. They got destroyed after World War II. They tried to destroy them when they wanted unification by, again, the US said you can have unification, but you're going to have to adopt the European Union as it is now and the euro. So they tried to control them there. They're still trying to control them there. I don't think Germany's going to want to be destroyed again for for the third or fourth time in 100 years. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, I've just noticed it. An hour. Where does it go? Uh, whenever we're talking to you, it seems like we've just got warmed up, just just got really going, and suddenly the hour's up. So uh, we'll play our usual um, on the hour break and uh, found something quite appropriate uh, from Billy Holiday. So we'll be back in about three and a half minutes. Tony Moran, WBF Cruiserweight World Champion, speaking on Rack and Tear News. news.com stay tuned for more untwisted unsweetened news please consider buying a t-shirt or making a donation to help support us
Thank you for your support. We do it for us all. And welcome back to Raconteurs News. I'm very sorry for the uh, peers. We're having audio troubles on the live show. Um, but it should all be uh, recorded and available on playback um, within about five minutes of the show ending. So if you're missing large chunks of it, apparently our audio is drifting in and out. Um, if you're missing anything, then if you wait till the show's finished, um, give it about five minutes and refresh the page and you should be able to listen again to the whole show or any bits that you missed. I'm very sorry about that. We've got a technical team working behind the scenes, working very hard, and we have got a new broadcast set up coming very soon. Uh, we're just beta testing it at the moment, and so we should be able to do away with these problems uh, very soon. So many apologies for that, and uh, we'll get back to Paul. Welcome back, Paul. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, so um, where are we going to start for the second hour then, Paul? I thought we'd talk a bit about this scene, St. Petersburg Forum that happened on 16th, 17th, 18th uh, of June. Mm -hmm. I think many people in, in are seeing it as kind of a rival to the whole Davos thing, although, frankly, I think the Davos thing is just, uh, is just uh, some kind of narcissistic gathering of people from with the cabal with this kind of, Whereas I think, you know, the St. Petersburg Forum is far more constructive. And, and why is it interesting? Well, there was a number of, a lot of major foreign companies turned up. Ironically enough, of course, the United States didn't have any representation, but no surprise there. But I think the fact that the kind of leaders of major foreign companies visited this, you know, International Economic Forum is a sign that both Russia and the EU want to ease sanctions officially and actually the German newspaper Handelsblatt reported this and it said this you know initiative could significantly add to diffusing the ongoing standoff between Russia and Ukraine over this implementation of Minsk too which is frankly farcical because of the Ukrainians are the ones not implementing anything but what was interesting in terms of this international forum it wasn't just attended by the heads of organizations who actually ironically from the West had remained absent. I mean, this in years gone by, it was all kind of China and Eastern you know, representation. But we actually, this year, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, who's obviously the European Commission president, he turned up. And also um, the Italian uh, president turned up as well, who actually, of course, in recent times, has been signing a lot of trade agreements with Russia and seems to be a little bit of a Russia file on the, on the quiet, as it were. So they, this, these were quite interesting developments. Now, what came out of the meeting um, was that there's a thing called Lindy Group, who actually I did a bit of work for for a time quite a few years back. Um, and their chief executive was saying that Moscow is strongly interested in maintaining a dialogue between the European Union and this Eurasian Economic Union stroke, the Shanghai Cooperative Organization and all the other kind of umbrellas that... Um, this Eurasian Triangle operates under. But also he stated that apparently Angela Merkel was in favour of this dialogue, you know, which obviously could eventually lead to the creation of some common economic space, which is this much born to think it will stretch all the way from Lisbon in Portugal to Vladivostok in the east of Russia. Um, and it seems that Merkel and Juncker want to uh, kind, of, kind of, in inverted commas, cosy up to, to Russia and to try and make corrections on the development of this conflict in Ukraine. I think privately they realise Ukraine's the problem and Russia isn't. But of course publicly they're not going to admit this because it will rile the, the, the Americans. And I think provided you don't say too much publicly like what's said privately uh, is an entire different matter. Now we know at the end of the month the EU's will decide on the extension of these anti-Russian sanctions. Now of course they're going to go, oh yes we'll have to maintain these sanctions. But we know full well that the German Foreign Minister Steinmeier plans to go ahead with easing sanctions anyway. And uh, this, you know, so once again, it's paying lip service on the one hand, but in reality, doing something very different. And you know, it's all about seemingly wanting to, to deal as well with Russia and Ukraine. You know, we talked before the show what's going on 
with in terms of Ukraine, and Ukraine's gone very quiet. I mean, the US have backed out. The question is, how long is Poroshenko going to last? But I think we're now starting to see a lot of political pressure coming from the West wanting to resolve the whole issue of Ukraine. Um, because also there was talk coming out of um, this, um, obviously, the economic forum in St. Petersburg. They want to ease uh, visa restrictions for Russian politicians um, uh, as well in terms of that's another initiative and also initiatives to do with this weakening these trade and financial sanctions. And they, this um, obviously chief executive of Lindy has also expressed concerns about what was going on in Ukraine. Uh, what the reasons were for you know social unrest and and this prolonged downturn in, in the economy. So it wasn't about kind of just paying lips. There was some really serious discussions that went on, and it's starting to look increasingly that the St. Petersburg Forum is going to end up usurping this Davos Economic Forum. Um, and I think there's going to be far more economic emphasis to work with Western corporations, but also Western nations. And it seems as though it, it's a, a forum where there's this idea, well, the U.S. haven't turned up and we're not really interested in the U.S. There's an isolation of the U.S. No, no U.S. corporate executives turned up. Lots of European corporate executives turned up. And with, I, for me, we're starting to see in full effect the isolation of the U.S. from a Eurasian kind of Germany, Russia, uh, Chinese and an Iranian kind of Eurasian triangle perspective and I think we're increasingly seeing this of what came out of Davos and uh, it looked and from what I heard from insiders that there's a kind of idea the Western cabal's on the ropes now and these European nations are beginning to, to see that as a reality and that's not something that you know has come out of any of these meetings previously because frankly from the St. Petersburg Economic Forum the West never really bothered being there but there was a lot of presence there and a lot of constructive dialogue. So, there were a lot of big hitters, weren't there? I mean, um, Valentina Matvinenko, she was there as well, weren't she? Chairman of the uh, Federation Council of the Rus Russian Federation. So she, she was there. P Vladimir Putin was there. He spoke at, at, at it as well. So we're talking about some really, really big hitters. It's, it's interesting that this has not been more um, in the media in the West. If you know, you know, it, 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 it seems to me it's, um, it's a little bit like a, a Bilderberg Group meeting. Well, from the yesteryear when the Bilderberg Group was 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 you know relevant. I mean, it's quite funny how they spent years denying that the Bilderberg meeting even happened or existed or group existed. And then as soon as they acknowledged it, all the alternative media started going on about it like it had any relevance. And no, seriously, as soon as the cabal admits to anything, it's irrelevant. It's just that theatre to try and distract people and that it does rather amuse them when I see these people in the alternative community making some capital out of a meeting that frankly is irrelevant but that's it, we're digressing a little bit on that point but something else that came out um, uh, clearly from the from this forum was the European companies are actually ignoring Russian sanctions and they openly spoke about it at this economic forum, they freely admit they're working with Russia despite these sanctions and these kind of corporations and executives see now see they don't need to conceal that they're doing business. And there was over 300 agreements worth 16 billion dollars signed at this economic forum. That is that is pretty significant. I mean, there were some obvious ones that, for example, like the Italians had signed. But what I think uh, is transpiring, it proves that Western companies now don't really see the fear. They don't have the fear that they did of working, uh, you know, with Russia and despite these economic sanctions. And what Putin did say during the forum was that the European businesses desire to cooperate with Russia and that Western politicians need to start to acknowledge that that is the will of these corporations and executives and react accordingly. And what was interesting is the Swiss kind of chipped in with this. and There was quite a bit of coverage in the Swiss media well, they said the considerable increase of foreign companies attending this year's forum compared to, you know, obviously previous years. So they, they reported all this. And they also said, you know, we don't see any reason to conceal doing business anymore with Russia. And it also appears, and we, people will go, oh, these are cabal companies. But we've got to bear in mind the world's changing. And if you believe the cabal's 
going and his dad and Barry. All these organisations can't stay as cabal organisations. They're going to have to move or, or die, basically. And Swiss companies have made up their mind a while ago, and we're talking big corporations, so in the Barclays, Nestle consider Russian as an important export market. And also, some of the Swiss uh, sort of business uh, executives seem to have admitted they're quite, they're really happy to invest further in Russia and they consider exporting Russian goods to other markets as well as part of that process. And, they, and you know, the, the Swiss media also pointed out that Switzerland attracted considerable attention during the forum by taking part in public discussion on cooperation with Russia. And I think the statement that came out was crises come and go, but Switzerland remains loyal to its partners, will maintain neutrality in conflicts, and will keep its word. Now, you know, some people might say that they're big words, but uh, but certainly we're seeing evidence of Switzerland doing. We saw Germany doing it. Certainly, you know, the Italian Prime Minister Renzi turned up, and they signed quite a substantial amount of economic agreements. And we're we're starting to see. I think you know, I put a link up where with Putin, where he was rounding on the CNN guy, and, and Renzi sat next to him. And, there's certainly a you know a, a significant relationship developing between Italy and uh, and Russia, and certainly we know Greece and Russia are most certainly doing that. Uh, back and, back to Switzerland, do you, do you think that there's any correlation between what you're talking about and Switzerland recently um, withdrawing their application to join the join the EU? Yeah, I mean we know it's been on the table for a long time. But it's always the case, people say, well, it's been on the table for a long time, so it's kind of meaningless. Well, you could equally say, well, it's pretty meaningless to retract it. I don't think it is. I think that was a clear statement, you know, to to the real power broke. Well, we seem to not be power brokers in the European Union. We're no longer playing ball with us. And, yeah, I don't think it's any coincidence that it ties in with this whole time of, uh, of what's gone on in this forum in St. Petersburg. And we're hearing a lot of public statements made, which is clearly in defiance of, of uh, what the European Union is being told to do. Um, and they're, they're, so who knows what was discussed privately. Uh, and, you know, something to take that a bit further, of, you know, does, I think it's the end of the month, obviously, the EU leaders, in inverted commas, are supposed to decide on prolonging sanctions, uh, the summit in Brussels. But What's interesting is several EU member states have voiced their disapproval of the automatic prolonging of these restrictive measures. Now, apparently, but we know what the European Union does. If one nation says vote against it, then they can't carry them on. And Italy have said they are not interested in these anti-Russian sanctions. Hungary have said it. Cyprus, Greece and other European Union member states who were perhaps a little bit less uh, wish to be exposed to admitting it publicly, have spoke against the extension. And you know, this was publicly expressed as well inside this uh, you know, forum in St. Petersburg. And, uh, and no doubt about it, we're seeing, I, I saw this, this forum as being a huge sea change in terms of Europe rotating east and Europe you know, not even politely turning to its master in the U.S. And, and sticking the finger up at them and saying, sorry, we're not interested anymore in, in your viewpoint. We're going to start looking after our own interests. So, And this is, of course, why ultimately the US cabal are so desperate to keep the European Union going and why Brexit is um, would be, for me, is like the, probably the colour revolution, as we said earlier, in terms of the breakup of the European Union. But it doesn't matter. The European Union is dead and buried. It's going to die sooner rather than later. Is it going to die diplomatically and in a civilised manner, or is it just going to implode? And I'd rather see the former than the latter, because we don't want to see people in European nations or anywhere else in that world have a very hard landing, because it will be seriously detrimental to perfectly innocent people, and we need to obviously avoid that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we I got a very um, wordy email from... Um, one of your followers called Dave and mm-hmm. um, quite a lot of it is asking about timescales and also about um, the order in which things are going to happen, which obviously 
um, you know, if you got that sort of information, you'd be ab absolutely able to name your own price. But he tagged on to the yeah, end. Have, if I knew that, I'd have Putin phoning me up. <laughs> like, can you come over to Russia and let's have, let's have a cup of tea in the Kremlin and, and tell us all you know. Because, you know, the truth is, you know, I can speculate, but I mean, I can speculate for an hour or two on the show about what, how I think things are going to pan out. But it is just speculation. And there is so many permutations of possibility. And, you know, okay. time scales, you know, I gave what was told to me would be early 2016. It hasn't happened for, for, for whatever reason that might be. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to start giving time scales. I mean, yeah, it could happen 2016. All this talk, I mean, I'm hearing people say, oh, it's going to happen in October. Well, yeah, because most financial crashes seem to happen in October. Well, that's not a reason for why it's going to happen. And so time scale wise I'm not, not going to get drawn into that because I don't know. I mean, the person who I need to speak to to try and get an update on this is still out of, um, you know, off radar and has been for four months. Wow. I haven't spoken to them once. That There is good reason. They're perfectly okay, but... The reasons for that, and which I don't really fully understand, but when I'm able to speak to them, I might have a better understanding of what they think is going on in, in terms of time scale. But I've had many conversations with them in the past, and we, and we both just say it's impossible to know what the cause of it could be. Yeah, it could be a bank collapse. Mm -hmm. The talk of Deutsche Bank, I mean, what we certainly can say is that every day there's four banks in Western Bank that are you know, bailing water, for want of a better analogy. And they're living a kind of you know, terrified existence of collapsing on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. that's one example. It could be you know, sovereign debt might crush a nation and cause a catalytic effect across Europe. It could be a bank in the US. Yeah. It could be a whole bunch of reasons why you know, what's going to be precipitated. You know, China suddenly decided to arbitrage gold and said, we set the gold price at two and a half thousand dollars an ounce mayhem will ensue because the derivatives paper market will just blow up and that will blow up the Western financial system. The bond markets, despite someone recently telling me the bond markets have no relevance, which I find incredible that someone should think that, you know, they're in negative territory. They, they are imploding, so the bond markets could cause massive uh, contagion problems and blow everything up. There's so many possibilities of what order it's going to happen. I don't know I mean, Mm, you know, no, absolutely. But if I did know, then yeah, I'd be I'd be doing a live podcast from, with Putin and <laughs> telling you all what, what what I thought was going on. Well, Truthfully, what the order? I've got no idea. Well, and next, I don't know anyone else who's got a, any idea either. Next time you're over in Moscow, Paul, and when you're having <laughs> tea with Putin, uh, do tell him <laughs> it, we'd love to have him on our show. Um, but <laughs> at, at the end of Dave's. Um, uh, email there, he does ask one question which um, I have heard voiced several times by listeners and it, it, it's one thing that does seem to, to kind of be a bit of a stumbling block in the back of people's minds and Dave asks if the good guys are waiting for the bad guys to be completely stripped of all power and money so this cannot ever happen again how exactly do they manage it these guys have been running the media farmer, politicians and everything else Short of life in prison or shooting them, how do you shut them down permanently? And here's the clincher. If they control everything, how do we even know this isn't just a series of media, le media leaks that are they are orchestrating to change the system to meet their next version of control? Well, we know for well, the first or latter point, we know absolutely that's not the case because, you know, Russia, China and the whole BRICS alliance and 70 percent of the world is not behaving the way they were, so you know, and they don't have any control over them. So that's absolutely not the case. Now, yeah, there's this argument, well, the cabal control it. Well, I've just given you an example of the St. Petersburg Forum, how the, the European nations are changing and saying, we're not putting up with this anymore. This is a huge sea change. That has only come about because the cabal is weak. And why is the cabal weak? Well, look at what happened. They, they lost the war in they backed out of Syria with the tail between the legs and are doing nothing to prevent ISIS, which is their creation, from being obliterated off, off the map in the Middle East. It's, you know, they've tried this coup in Brazil. It's failing. 
everything they try to do is failing. Now, this, the reason this fails it is, oh, hello, there's a dog barking in the background. Sorry about that. Um, the, the rationale behind why they're failing is because if we look at it, it's, it's as much economic. The de-dollarization, everybody knows that's happening. That's how you cripple the department. You don't have to destroy them overnight. You just take them down uh, gradually. To uh, And that's what's been happening, particularly in acceleration of that in the last couple of years, where we've seen de-dollarization. We've seen trade agreements side between nations trading in non-dollar terms. And they've been bypassing the U.S. in every end of term. That's gone away. You know, the U.S. controlling influence and the dollars controlling influence. So we're seeing clear evidence all the time of a weakening in the cabal. The media, yeah, the, the media can still spin all the rubbish they want. It doesn't matter because they can spin all the crap with the markets, which they do. You know, they can pump markets. They can drive currencies, whichever which way they like, smash the price of paper up. But the economic reality is there for all to see. I mean, we're seeing the retail sector in the U.S. is a good example, which is in which is in free fall now. The U.S. economy is largely service based. Well, if that part of their economy is tanking, what does it tell us about the rest of the U.S. US economy? And we've seen all the stats coming out. You know, economic reality is killing the cabal. They can fudge all these things, but you know, no one cares anymore. No one's interested. It doesn't matter whether it's thousand, eighteen, twenty, fifty, or a hundred thousand. It's irrelevant. Because if you look at all the stats coming out from the businesses in terms of the figures they produce, it doesn't support the valuation of their stock. They're massively overvalued. And everybody knows this, but nobody cares anymore about that. So the way you destroy the cabal is to, is to destroy the dollar. And that's what's been happening. And it's not going to happen overnight. And this is why people say to me, and I understand the frustration, well, I still see chemtrails in the sky. The cabal haven't gone away. Well, I've said it many times and nothing's changed. You won't get rid of the cabal in entirety uh, in terms of expecting in that part of that process that the chemtrail is going to disappear first. That's the last thing that's going to disappear. Yeah. But gradually, you know, their, their ability, the narco trade is, is being severely restricted now. And we're starting to see, you know, the dollar's being screwed. It's a, it's a process that happens. It doesn't mean that it has to be squeezed totally for the cabal to employ. The cabal are obviously deeply divided now as well amongst themselves, and a lot of them have backed off and don't really want to be part of it anymore. So it is an ongoing process. But if you think the cabal are winning, well, look at where they've failed. We've never had World War III. They failed in Iran. They failed in Syria. They failed in Egypt. They failed in Ukraine. They'll fail in Brazil. They're, they're failing to implement the policies in the European Union, that's disintegrating and breaking up. The nations have had enough of the St. Petersburg Forum proves that. De dollarization proves that. Nations are trading with each other. Iran is, is just carrying on now, trading with everybody and ignoring the fact that the US is still trying to insist on sanctions. The rest of the world doesn't care and isn't interested in the ultimate ignominy for the cabal. Is. The world just regards Washington as a joke. They don't even think they have any relevance in North America actually publicly laughing at them where previously they privately were. So no, there's yeah. clear evidence that the cabal are, are on the ropes. And therefore, you know, the idea as well that oh, well, the cabal's rotating and they're just merely presenting you know, a different face of Russia and China and the cabal, well, absolutely not, because Russia would n will never, and neither will China, sell its own nation down the river. Yeah, Western nations have done it for, for you know, sometimes 100 years, 200 years, whatever it might be, or longer. The Russians and the Chinese had a lot of cabal influence, which was not enabling them to run their country efficiently. Well, they've largely removed those, and they keep seeing every week more and more people being expelled from parties, being arrested on corruption charges. They're cleaning their nations up. They're not perfect, but compared to Western nations, they're far further down the track in clearing up the mess in their own countries. And they no desire to to be at the back and call. Why would they trust the Rothschilds who destroyed their nation? Why would they trust the neocons who'd be trying to drag them into world wars? Are they seriously going to go, oh yeah, we'll, we'll just trust you guys. We'll roll over and allow you to, to carry on mm. under the umbrella of our nation. It's simply not going to happen. How how <clears throat> we we were talking when we were talking in the in the break while well, we had a little bit of music break and we were talking about what we're going to be 
chatting about in the second hour. Uh, I mentioned Dubai. Now, um, th there have been conflicting reports. I've heard things from sort of like 2008 and 2009 where things economically had, had just completely slowed down in Dubai. And, and I, I looked on as a, 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 a not, um, an onlooker with an interest because I used to live there back in, in, in the 90s and I could see what it was like then. Um, but I'd heard that it had um, economically it was struggling. Now, I've just noticed, I'm just looking at um, a brochure from um, the um, St. Petersburg Forum, and I noticed that there's a, a, sult a listed as one of the speakers is a Sultan Ahmed bin Suleyam, who is apparently a big cheese in Dubai. And below that, there is another speaker, a Sheikha Dea bin Ibrahim Al Khalifa, who is, um, I think she's the, the sovereign queen of Bahrain. And, and those are, so if, if Dubai have been having um, financial difficulties and the economy has been struggling, which, like you said, you don't know, you've got conflicting reports. But I certainly know that there's been unrest and, and things going on in Bahrain. Uh, and, and for these people to turn up at this conference, do you think they're, they're looking for something different or... Um, oh yeah, they, well they, there's a recognition. They know they were just put on a pedestal. As a, I mean, really, it was a way of let's contain Iran in the past from a cabal perspective, and let's promote nations. So Qatar was another one, and, uh, and obviously Qatar's got its own problems. I mean, there's a war going on. You wouldn't think there was a war going on in in in, uh, in, in Yemen, for example. So there's lots of upheaval and problems in, in the Middle East. At least re nations recognise that. The rise of Iran, they're going to become superfluous in, from a from a cabal perspective. So they're going to have to look for other ways to reinvent themselves. It's going to be rather difficult. And this is where this conflict of interest. You know, I know people who've left Dubai and moved their businesses to China and Hong Kong because they see no future there. And I've got a good, really good friend of mine I've known for years who lives there and is, tells me, you know, everything's fine. I'm, I don't have a problem, and he's perfectly happy there. So. You know, there, there are some conflicting interests as to what is actually going on uh, in terms of Dubai, but certainly the, the map of the Middle East is changing, and Qatar's actually was a long-held kind of cabal-controlled nation, and they're moving away and wanting to have ties with with Russia and China, and, and certainly we're seeing this move, and I don't doubt they probably were at this economic forum for precisely that reason, because there's a recognition they're all going to have to rotate east, and it's not a, a Eastern hegemony, it's a recognition that the world's changing and we need to work together and we need to move away from the US and, and by, by, by association it causes this isolation and I still don't see any evidence of anyone in the US I mean yeah, Trump said he wants normalisation of relations with Russia and spoke about other things but apart from him, I've not heard anybody else showing any indication he wants to Join and change in this to this new world of uh, multipolarity, etc. But there's just no even the slightest hint. They don't want to bend in terms of Russia. They're not really. You know, they're paying lip service to China and, and very loosely trying to pretend that there might be some common ground. But the U.S. is just increasingly looking more and more isolated now. How the U.S. handles its own affairs is up to that. It's not for for us to kind of get involved in. But it, they're going to have to, at some point, have a seat change. Now, if they elect Clinton, well, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, that's never going to happen. Um, it just simply won't be, because Clinton will immediately do what Clinton will do, and will go on this well, on this war footing. and It's not going to work. And ultimately, it would blow up in their face. But I, would I, could I conceive that, well, the U.S. election is an argument, will it happen? I mean, it may not happen, it may happen. If it happens, I wouldn't rule out, sadly, that the US ends up with Clinton as president. If it does, well, it's committing suicide by voting her into power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I was just sort of thinking, when, when I mentioned those two um, those two individuals that were, that were at this economic forum, I just wondered whether do you think that they're there because they're looking for something different because of what America's done to them? Or do you think America are doing to them what they're doing um, and, and causing unrest and, and social unrest and causing 
uh, destabilizing these countries. Um, do you think they're doing that as because as a result of these people looking towards Russia? So, well, I think that, well, I think no, I think with Dubai and nations like that, they're recognizing the need to diversify. I mean, they're certainly nettling, as we know, in Yemen. And the U.S. forces are involved in, in, in Yemen, and that war is going on. You wouldn't think anything is happening there, but it's still ongoing. Um, so that's one issue. But yeah, the, I think no, there's, it, it's a kind of mix. I mean, obviously we know they're trying to meddle in Syria. We know they're trying to meddle in Iraq, but obviously increasingly Russia is starting to assist there. So it, it's a combination of, of things. So some nations are being meddled with, but I think. Dubai particularly, is it's just a recognition we're going to have to change and evolve, otherwise we're just going to, to die as a financial centre. You know, it's a, it's a big, huge gold hub for, for gold trading. That would eventually, of course, risk disappearing altogether, and it could literally just be turned into desert again, and that is a big problem. And obviously, they don't want that to happen. Do, do, you, think that, own... do you think there's a lot of debt attached to... Um, there's been a lot of building in Dubai. I mean, I wouldn't recognise it. I was only there 20 five years ago, uh, and, and really that we were only 20 years um, past it being a desert. Um, so it, it would not look anywhere like, anything like the, uh, the, the, the Dubai that I would remember. But do you think that because of all the building, do you think that they're in a, there's a lot of debt um, attached to Dubai? No, I don't think there is in that sense. I think, well, we all know that. If anyone ends up in debt in Dubai, I mean, it's, you know, if you if you take a loan out in Dubai, you, and you'll know this, you have to write all, say you take it out over two years, you have to write 24 checks. Yeah, yeah, pre, yeah, post date checks. checks. And if any of them bounce, they'll throw you in prison. Yeah. Um, you know, without, without a breath, you know. You well, they'll it. throw you in prison for anything. I got thrown in prison because I had a road accident that weren't even my fault. But I went in prison for like um, uh, like, like half a day until it got sorted out. And so that was just a simple road accident yeah. that, that, that nobody was injured or anything. No, so I, I don't I don't see any. I mean, I truthfully don't know the economics of Dubai that well. But no, I, I, I think the biggest problem for Dubai is that, I mean, there is this case that a lot of real estate there you can, you can buy very cheaply. And I know there was deals where people would have to go and live in five-star hotels and pay thousand dollars a night they were doing deals at the turn of the year for 75 dollars a night plus thrown in breakfast i mean so there are huge problems but that's because people just aren't visiting their businesses and pulling out and they're tr trying to attract reinvestment but you know, where how what the future lies for for much of the middle east is is is, is interesting as well as it is you know, for the uk and, and europe and the u.s and all the other nations of the world is part of this transition phase. So, um, I mean, we'll guess we'll see what happens in terms of Dubai. Mm -hmm. So, um, I believe you said you'd also like to mention tonight, Paul, that you uh, starting a new website. Yeah, we thought we we kind of gave a little subtle hint, and I put the link upon the Facebook page and. Um, and of course, it's in maintenance mode, and Lisa's done all the work for that. And I've sent Andy. We're not re releasing it yet, but Andy's seen the logo, and um, and it, I'm not being biased, but I think it looks fantastic. I'd, I'd absolutely agree. I think Lisa's done a great job on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's all Lisa's work. Nothing to do with me. She's but she's the creative uh, force behind all, and she's done the work on all the website. And is is you know encouraging me to start to write some more articles and Lisa is going to be writing articles because we're expanding it not just from the geopolitical stuff which the Facebook page will be but it will have health technology and and all and various other subjects so we're broadening the scope of it and it'll still be called seriousreport.com we've registered the domain and the website will go live as, as soon as possible and we'll start to populate it with, with material it's going to be all article based stuff it's not just regurgitating links it's going to be more editorial content mm -hmm. and we just want to build it and develop it and see where we can take it because we'd like to maybe we're, we're, we're punching up of our weight by saying this but we'd like it to become a credible kind of online media alternative which is about producing real news backed by fact and has context and gives people the idea of what we know is going on and we understand and, and also you know you talk about how things like the inclined bad thing, you know, that'd be a great thing that we can 
include and, and, and get some focus on that and more people to understand that. There are what? massive, huge health issues and implications. All this new technology coming out. Uh-huh. You know, one very small example is China's got this supercomputer now with no US chips in it. Well, that's going to seriously annoy the, the, the NSA and all the rest of them. But it shows that technologically these nations are uh, really making advances. You know, Russia's got huge amounts of military advanced technology and other technology. The Chinese, I know, are working on some very, very interesting health technology. And I can, something I can tell you, but I can't tell you who's involved. There's a very big Western corporation who's actually involved in developing some health technology, um, which is which people would say is kind of, you know, to some people they might regard it as being a bit of kind of space age technology, but they're involved in it. And I can't say who the organization is, but you'd be really surprised if you realized who it was. And uh, that's another indication how you know, these organizations and corporations are breaking the shackles away from, from their masters, so to speak. That is great news, Paul. And, and on the subject of inclined bed therapy, I know we always get a lot of listeners in, especially for you, and um, they don't tend to hang around. So I would urge anyone who's tuned into this show, whether you're on our Raconteurs News website or whether you're on the Spreaker site, to check out our archives. And the show last night was absolutely phenomenal. We had a 42-year-old homeless guy on who's just won a boxing world championship. And he credits, uh, obviously he had to train and work very hard for this, but he credits a great deal of his success and the edge that he's got that enabled him him to win the title to uh, this health therapy that costs you absolute peanuts to do. Uh, it, well, it's virtually free. If you've got some bricks or bits of timber you lying around anywhere, you can do it entirely for free. Uh, it's transformed my life, my partner's life, the same for Jason and the same for Jason's wife. So I can't recommend it highly enough. And uh, we'd like to offer people a bit of something extra while they're listening to you, Paul. I'm, gl- I'm, no, glad, you ca- I'm glad you clarified that, Andy, because, uh, you know, when you said it, Last night you said it's changed my life and it's changed my partner's life. I didn't know whether you meant me or Lube. Oh, well, if the cat fits, <laughs> mate, wear it. <laughs> but no, you know, I mean, obviously we know we focus on the geopolitical stuff, but we kind of decided we like to kind of, and the, the web, the, sorry, the Facebook page will continue to do that, but we'd like to expand the, this, the website um, to, to encompass a lot of different subject areas and it. Because we kind of do, we want to make it into a news outlet, but how we'd like to see news presented. And, you know, it may never take off in a big way. I mean, we'll see what happens. But, you know, if we plant the acorns, we may grow some oak trees and we'll see see where we go with it. But we see a need and we know this, that we want proper news. We want proper journalism where subjects are investigated. We get the answers. We put the context. We have the the critical analysis of, of the subject matter and let's get let's start to have the news outlet does that and I'm not saying there aren't other people who do it of course but, but we like to be part of that process and, and you know, in the fullness of time we'll do that uh, then, of course initially everything's going to be free but at some point you know, we might be able to monetize things um, and we'll see what happens but we'd like to do interviews with people and, and you know, from all backgrounds different things I mean Apart from Putin, you know, hopefully we can get some other talk people on, and um, you know, we can we can go through that process of, of getting different subject matter into out there so people understand it and realise that you know, there are a lot of great people trying to do a lot of good things. And, uh, you know, let's let's raise the focus on that and get some better understanding. So it's not just about the geopolitical stuff. That's excellent, Paul. And uh, I suppose while you're here. Um, I'm sure your um, followers would be very interested now. Have you got any other radio interviews booked in the near future? No, I haven't actually. It's been a bit of a, I've had a bit of a crazy few weeks. Um, from my own perspective, uh, there's some quite weird things going on. I'm trying to deal with them and um, seemingly making no progress whatsoever in a lot of ways. So no, there isn't anything else at the moment. I know someone wanted on the page wanted me to try and line me up to go and do an interview with someone else but we'll see if anything transpires with that 
but no, not at the moment. I mean, obviously that's something maybe we need to look into more um, in terms of doing more interviews and maybe just doing some podcasts and stuff and generally, you know, bringing some subject matter to the ball. But this is all part of development and naturally we'd welcome people's input as to what, you know, once we go live as to things we'd like to see on there and if we can accommodate them, then of course we will be. Well, we, we've got our new broadcasting setup coming on stream very soon, Paul. So uh, if you'd like to do a one-off or a regular show, I'm sure the... Well, obviously, we we uh, run things on a very democratic basis here. And um, we, we kind of all agree on which way we're going to move forward. But um, I'm quite sure most of the others would be agreeable to you coming and doing that with us if that's something you like to no, do. No, well, you know, we always said, you know, you, we worked with you from day one, and in fact, you were the one who twisted my arm for a long time to do it, and eventually Lisa twisted it a bit more metaphorically, and I decided to do it, and I'm really glad we did, and, you know, I always you know, will want to do, you know, the shows with you, I really enjoy doing it, and uh, so whatever the future holds, and wherever we go, and whatever happens, you know, I always, it's always good to remember the people who helped you in in terms of what you did, and you, you and Thomas as well. Or Tom, you know, were also, you know, both instrumental in doing that. And you know, I have all the time in the world for for both of you, and you know that. And you know, we talk from time to time off air, and we've always got ideas. And you know, if we can help help each other, and then of course we'll naturally do that. Absolutely, yeah. We, I, I think it is so important that um, that anyone with good ideas um, needs to collaborate with others. I mean, obviously, the, there is always the danger. The larger your group gets, the more danger of infiltration is. But you don't necessarily have a large group to to cooperate with like minded people, do you? No, and we've not had we've not had infiltration on our Facebook group. We've never had problems. Yeah, there's people who disagree. Well, that's fine. That's not a problem. I don't don't have an issue with that. People are very civilized. But I know there's issues with other groups that have gone on, and we're not going to discuss those. But because it's not relevant. But no, we. I'm never going to entertain that. This is this is about a collective where we all need to pull our resources, understanding, and work together, and we can help each other whoever it is, whether it's you, me, or whoever else it is, then, then we need to do that. And that's what this is all about. And this is another reason why our, my Facebook page is an open group. I've never understood. Why would you have a closed Facebook group? You're interested in freedom and, and spreading the word and understanding. Why would you close your group? You, you, you're restricting. Your, it's like you're telling everyone, well, we've got this nice club of X thousand people, but we don't want anyone else in it unless... They get invited in. Well, well, how are you going to spread the word if you hide what you're talking about? It doesn't make any sense to me. And that's why the group will always be a public group. And, you know, yes, we, we moderate the posts. Well, and that's fine. And everyone's quite happy with that. So if people want to post, then, you know, we have to approve them. Because that's more to do with content. I approve a lot of stuff. So does Lisa. We don't necessarily agree with it. Mm-hmm. The only thing we don't is we don't just pull the ET stuff and all that. Because we've said we, that's not part of the group. We're not restricting it because we, you know we don't agree with things or disagree. It's just not the content that, that you know the, the group's about. But that's what this is all about. And if we don't work together, and then how are we going to co- you know how do we progress and move forward? I mean, it's no good telling people there's an alternative way of looking at it while we're all squabbling with each other about you know some petty reason why you know you know my dad's bigger than yours or I'm taking my football home and you can't play with it anymore kind of thing. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, if if we do that, we're doing the cabal's job for them, aren't they? They don't need to defend themselves against us if we're all busy fighting each other. Yes, precisely, and yeah, and that's something we just need to avoid. And and I think we can do that, and we just carry on doing what we're doing. In small ways, we're all helping helping the cause. And for every person who listens and hasn't listened before, and you know, it might change their perspective on things they might think of things differently and it is you know acorns and oak trees and this will go on and the hard work will start even more so when the world transitions because there's going to be millions and billions of people out there in the whole world who don't know anything who are going to be like what what's going on what has really happened and, you know, what you know what what is really this situation like, what world was i living in so 
the work's ongoing and it will be for a long time. But hopefully in the future, it'll be easier to spread the word and uh, let people understand things because we won't have the resistance that, that we experience now. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And, and, and that, that's a really good point as well. Uh, coming together, all different um, subjects. Like you say, you, there are things you don't touch, um, but uh, all, all different subjects and getting a website together and, and putting, if you, that, that's what we're really missing is we're really missing um, news that hasn't got an agenda. It's just facts, fact based. Mm -hmm. mm, no, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the point. And, you know, I, as we've done the shows, and if I speculate, I'm going to say, look, I'm speculating on this point. And it's important to say, but when we talk about things, we just try to be factual. And, you know, we, took, we go back 12 months to when we did the shows and we talked about things. And pretty much a lot of what we've said has come to pass because we based it in fact. You know, we talked about when there was all this idea, oh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, they're going to invade Syria. We said, no, it's never going to happen. But, and, of course, it hasn't. So if we base things in fact, we're more likely to be correct. I mean, yeah, things can change, but it's when people want to speculate and, and suggest they know kind of things that are happening or, well, I know stuff, but I'm not discussing it, you know, and, and if there's <laughs> things we can discuss, we'll discuss it. I mean, actually, just as a point of interest, I mean, we didn't mention, I was going to say before the show, which is kind of interesting that I found out yesterday regarding Deutsche Bank, is apparently they're in the process of canning all their contractors and then they're going to start culling their permanent staff. Uh, we can read whatever we like into that. But that's a hugely interesting development. That just came out of a friend of mine who who phoned me up and we were just having a general chat about things and what was going on. And, uh, and he just mentioned that somebody he knew, um, was he was made aware of that a couple of days ago. So these are interesting developments because it kind of suggests that they're going through a, a transition phase in terms of their business. Operations. Now that kind of suggests more of a soft landing than a hard landing, but of course, time will tell. Um, yeah, Paul. Uh, so yeah, within the last ten minutes of the show now. So um, it's always great to have you on, and uh, you bring a great deal of listeners with you, and we're always happy to have them. And I hope that a few of them will stick around and check out some of the shows that we've been doing because we've been having some absolutely phenomenal guests on just lately. And um, when you were talking about facts there and, and true journalism, uh, one that we had on quite recently was Eva Bartlett, um, a young Canadian lady who's spent uh, quite a bit of time out in Syria and in Gaza and she tells it like it really is, not the, not the rubbish you get from the lamestream press. And uh, I remember Eva did say that she would actually love to do a live show from Syria. And I know she's back and uh, I'm looking at her Facebook. Yesterday, she had a meeting with the Grand Mufti of Syria. So that that's the calibre of guests that we, we're getting on. Um, and, it's, you know, you know, and it's really important that, you know, we people, we hear these people and they're, you know, they're actually, you know, they're, they're seeing it with their own eyes. They're listening. They're being told things. They're talking to people. They're the eyes and ears in, to, the, to the real world situation. And, you know, Gaza is another great example. And we have to be a little bit careful because as much as we know there's propaganda on one side, we have to be careful that there's not, you know, distortion of facts and propaganda. You know, get the balance view from someone who, whose eyes are open and ears are open to what's going on and we will get better understanding of the story of what what is unfolding in the world because things are unfolding hugely and people say oh nothing's changing nothing's happening well it is but where it is it's that that critical understanding and the lack of context you know i say the st petersburg forums have people go well so what who cares about it, it doesn't mean it well no it absolutely means a huge thing because we're actually seeing what is unfolding and what how that applies to what's happening in europe and how it's changing these are big monumental steps. You know, we'll look back in history at, the, at this time and go, this was a groundbreaking, changing event that happened. Like the St. Petersburg Forum, like when Russia decided to militarily get involved in Syria. The list goes on and on. These are all really huge events, but without the context, they appear to be nothing. And that's why it's important when you listen to these other people to be, 
they're giving you even more context of what's happening and what's actually going on and what people really think of Assad as opposed to, you know, the political rhetoric coming out of the West about uh, who Assad is and what he is and, and what he isn't. So it is it is good to get these rounded views. So, you know, listen to other people. You know, it isn't about just listening to what I say. It's listen to, get as many people's perspective on things and listen to other people and uh, and uh, if... Deeds of the banking industry. So um, that that's great follow up to tonight's show. So uh, I hope well, everyone. Well, yeah, that, yeah then that, well, you know, we could one day we could talk about we could talk about that forever and a day. I mean, I know from inside stories. I've seen things that you know, it's like you know, we talked about the Wolf of Wall Street, and at least I watched. It, I said, you know, it's a lot worse than that. That sort of glamorizes the things that have gone on. I've you know, seen many, many horrendous things and unbelievable things that have happened. And, uh, so no, the, you know, whatever you people imagine, and it's ironic that people get this perspective of what's gone on, but there's equally the flip side where there's a lot of great people who work in the financial and they're just trying to earn a living. They don't earn huge amounts of money. They do work hard. They work long hours. They don't relatively get paid that well. And, you know, and I've a lot, over the years met some really good people, really nice people, really, you know, the kind of people you'd want to socialize with and be friends with. Yeah, there are, there is an element inside the, the financial system rot to the core but it's not everybody and you know we need to be careful who we tarnish and you know, paint everyone with the same brush because it's absolutely not the case mm -hmm. well we're about the end of the show there paul and as well, always thank you so much for coming on it's always great no, to it's talk a pleasure to you and um, we always run out of time uh, absolutely we always do um but it it Thank you, Jason, for tonight as well. You've been fantastic. And, and thank you to Jason's neighbour with the noisy motorbike. <laughs> Did you hear him then? That's what I have to put with. You have your seat time. It's nearly 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And that dickhead is driving about on his little stupid scrot. That's not even <laughs> legal. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Jason. Um, well, <laughs> We, we, we're we looking forward to speaking to John Hamer at, uh, tomorrow night and we'll be followed at, we, we're slight, starting slightly earlier at 7pm tomorrow night UK time that will be 2pm Eastern Standard if you're in the States or what is it 11am uh, on the Pacific Coast but um, we're really looking forward to that we'll be followed by Dr. Rock at 9 o'clock with Dr. Rock's radio show. Uh, I don't know what Doc's got in store for us this week, but it's always a great show. He plays some uh, amazing tunes, um, an awful lot of them that you've probably never heard of before, but you think, oh, my God, why haven't I heard of that? And he has some great guests, and uh, even if he doesn't have a guest, Doc has some, uh, some interesting discussions, even when he's on his own. So... Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. And yes, don't get too brexited. <laughs> that's Heath's <laughs> word, brexited. Yes, yeah, so next time we speak to you, we, we'll have a bit of an idea what went off. Or maybe we won't. Maybe it'll go way past our bedtime. But um, looking forward to see what happens tomorrow. And uh, it just remains well, we'll for know, me. We'll know Friday at some point. Yeah, absolutely. It just remains for me to say thank you to everyone for listening because without you, we'd be just talking to ourselves. And uh, we play out, uh, talking of Canadians, we've got a young lady here called Priscilla Una who will be joining us on the 5th of July to talk about um, her music career. She's quite a wide awake young lady, so we'll play out with one of her tunes. So thanks for listening, everyone, and good night. Bye, everybody. Good night, Paul. Good night. <laughs>
Just lift me up once again